Or afternoon, Arnie. Afternoon, Noel. How are you? Dav, great to see you guys. I'm looking forward to a good chat about Welsh football and where we're going. Yeah, thanks. Is thanks it strange for, for you to be in a room with two Irishmen now? Yeah, I, I, yeah, yeah. It is actually I'm not normally normally kind of that that a number. There's probably there's probably a joke in there somewhere. Um, but uh, yeah, no. How are you? You good? You well? Great. Um, I'm now in isolate, splendid isolation because we're getting ready for Qatar. Uh, and for the World Cup, so two days at home working through our strategy for the World Cup. But, you know, it's, it's a funny one because um, it feels like everything's kind of coming together very nicely. We have a lot of non-football activities happening. I mean, you saw the yeah, squad cool. announcement last night in Tyler's Town yeah. the Ronda. But, I mean, even this morning, for example, at the Jamboree, where over 200,000 children across Cymru were um, singing for their country and for it's football important. this morning with, with the earth. So it feels like, I mean, on Monday, we had to launch the World Cup song, Yamal Heed. And then we launched our sustainability strategy after that. There's big, these giant big bucket hats that are landing in cities across the country as well. Them, yeah. which, are, which are creating a bit of interest as well. So it just feels like there's all this stuff. We've been in the recording studio for the last few months. It feels creating songs. Um, thankfully, we're not like Chesney Hawks with one song. We've got a few different songs. Uh, <laughs> we're, we're a bit more like um, Ed Sheeran, thankfully. We're producing oh, nice. some, a, f- a few different uh, tunes. And as they're landing quite well, I suppose, because... Um, we have a, our brand, which we're very focused on putting out there. I mean, if you go up to the airport, Cardiff Airport, you'll see our brand very clearly for the World Cup. Um, and there's a team has left Cardiff this morning for oh, really? an advanced party who prepare all the rooms of the players, the training centre, nice, all nice. the different parts of what they'll see. And it's to remind the players of, I mean, it's fine to bring Michael Sheenan, which was amazing, uh, and the speech that he gave to the players about getting yeah. ready for going and bringing some more sugar with them was fantastic. But when they get there, you know, the imagery that they see and the um, the feelings that they get before they go and play the matches and when they're in their downtime should remind them of the three and a half million uh, people that stand behind them as they go out there to, to go onto the world stage. And it's a stage we haven't seen for 64 years, but it's a stage that we stride out onto very confidently. Uh, I'm very proud that we are here from, mm. from here in Cymru. And that we are um, going to put our name up there in lights to five billion people over the next few weeks. Yeah, I, I know we'll chat more about it later on. Uh, that note, but go back to that. Does it when when you send? I was going to say relics, but um, pictures, whatever it may be, of back home. Does it resonate then with the with the the guys that? Well, I'm representing every single village, town hall. Uh, Cons club, football club, even the rugby clubs. And if you're in a little bubble of Qatar and you're in a different place, sometimes you might just get swept away with everything else. But when when you see all the things of home, it kind of brings back, you know, I'm representing all of these people. I'm 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 honored and privileged to be one of the few that's lucky enough to be out there and representing my country on the biggest stage ever. It's it's um yeah, it's superb. Sorry, massively it does. I mean, the fact that we went to the Ronda up to Rob Page's hometown to the squad announcement. I mean, I know there was some commentary I saw about America were doing it at the Empire State Building. Yes. They were lighting up the building, uh, blue, red, and white, I guess. Um, you know, we chose to stay with our own values. And okay, they may not be as exotic and as sexy maybe as going to the Empire State Building or doing it maybe in Cardiff Bay or something like that. But that's us, you know, that suits who we are and our background. And I know it meant a lot to Rob. I know it meant a lot to people around the squad and around the association and supporters and that, that we chose to go back to up to an area that can be forgotten sometimes. It's post-industrialization, Ronda. Yeah. Um, but football is really loved up there. Um, and I know they really loved that yeah. last night, having up there. So you could see, I mean, I wasn't yeah. there, um, but I could hear... I was actually down in Swansea.com Stadium at a meeting with regional associations. So business does go on away from the World Cup, I can promise you. But, um, you know, it was lovely to see the reaction up there and to see, you know, the big broadcasters descend on a small town up in the Ronda and to make it feel special for a night. That's what it's all about for us. And it felt that way because from an outsider's point of view, it instead of doing it in... I don't know, Celtic Manor or down in St. David's in the Bay or something in a hotel room in a in a staged event to bring it to the people. It, it was a it was a superb shout because it, it almost felt there was a another connection with this professional organization and the community. Yeah, I think we work very hard on our connection. 
connection to us is everything, um, engagement to us is everything, and trying to understand what the people want, uh, and also our own values, what we represent and what we feel and what we think and what we believe in um, is important. So when they connect together, it's a pretty special thing to watch. And I think, you know, we've seen it. Certainly, I've been here since last um, late August. Um, I have to say, since the first day I got here, I felt a really strong personal connection with people um, right throughout our team. There's people here many, many, many years in the association, uh, the likes of Ian Gwyn, Gwyn Hughes and Mark Evans and others who have built up layers and layers and layers of connection with the people. But I have to say, I felt very welcome. But to see, it was almost like a, a beautiful marriage, to be quite honest with you, yeah. of my own thinking and my own um, background, I suppose, and to see it match all together beautifully with the Welsh football public and the Welsh public at large, actually, I felt at home instantly. Um, and that makes it very easy then when you're sitting down talking about concepts with the with the marketing and communications team or, or whoever they are. We just feel at home in what we're doing. We feel very comfortable with what we're talking about and what we're communicating with. I mean, we had they launched the World Cup anthem Monday morning, but Monday afternoon we launched something that to me was very important, which was the sustainability strategy. Now, why that was important is, you know, the country has the Wellbeing Future Generations Act, which is the only country in the world that's uh, create legislation for future generations to make the world better. Now, if you look at COP27 at the moment and you see yeah. some of the catastrophic results that are clearly heading our way, if we don't change our ways, and some of it's even gone beyond that, but they're heading there anyway. We saw what last summer was like as a, as a, as a teaser to what's coming. Um, but for us, in our own small part of the world, to um, say that football is not just out front here in Cymru, but we're actually out front globally in what we're doing. We're, I've not seen a better sustainability strategy in the world. I've not seen a government with a better sustainability piece of legislation than we have here. So if you join them together, it means that you're surrounded by people like the First Minister or Sophie, who's the Wellbeing Commissioner, who are thinking the same way as we are. So for me, that's just perfection where yeah. you know, our players, our staff, the governments, the Wellbeing Commission are all aligned on getting out front globally. So it's very much coming on the world stage. And yeah. you know, going to the World Cup gives us a chance to kind of make that even louder what we're trying to say. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's how are the how are the players feeling about everything at the moment? I haven't seen them. Um, I haven't seen them. <laughs> I haven't seen them. Um, they're all with their clubs, they're off one of them is off one of yeah. the, the American Super Bowl or whatever he's winning at this stage. Um, yeah. so you know we're seeing Aaron thankfully playing away with um nice or nice or whatever they call now and you see um you know you see players doing well thankfully a lot of our players seem to be doing really really well at their clubs um so you know we speak to them uh, there's a leadership group especially that we speak to on different matters i've spoken to a few of them individually over the last few weeks but very much the relationship there is, is between rob and the squad i speak yeah. to them on the strategy and different initiatives we're trying to do we'll speak to them on sunday when we all congregate yeah yeah uh, to go to the world cup we'll speak um about you know what the wider issues of going to Qatar and what that means for us and yeah. there'll be lots of questions going to be asked and just to have a kind of uh, an agreed belief system which we have anyway you know but what the challenges we face and yeah. you know, also the pride we, we 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 will have in putting our country in lights the world there's a lot to that and how we communicate that and the things that we produce over there whether it's using the players for social media content you know yeah. the different interviews that they'll be asked to do there's a lot happening. But what I can tell you is there has been some amount of filming over the last few months. I mean, it's if you like football and you like, you know, you like watching Cymru, it's going to be great for you because there's all sorts of programs that we've all taken part that have been filmed that haven't aired yet. Oh, so I'd say every night there'll be something about Welsh sport, about football. Uh, there's just a treasure trove of stuff to arrive. So I think it, like, it's, it's a great time in our lives. I mean, yeah. whatever happens over there, I'm sure we'll do really well over there. Whatever happens over this time is... It just feels like Christmas Day every day. Yeah, yeah. I, I think I said I think I think it's going to be great for Wales, great for the Welsh public, and I, you know, I, I think it's superb to be to be on that stage and and representing. I mean, it's going to it's going to be amazing. Um, so, some we we always kind of ask at the kind of beginning um, a little bit about you. Um, so, just just tell us about your journey, where it kind of began, and kind of getting to where you are now. Yeah, I was born in London, um, beside Arsenal Stadium, um, in an Irish community that was stuck among, between a Greek and a Turkish community. Um, and um, we became Arsenal fans very young. There was a lot of Irish players playing for Arsenal at the time, seven of them, 
uh, from Pat Jennings in goals right up to Frank Stables in front. Um, so I fell in love with Arsenal very quickly. But what happened was we moved back to the west of Ireland when I was um, four. Um, and it was different tempo then. Football wasn't the be all and end all then. Mm. Uh, there was other sports that were quite big. And in school, it wasn't particularly encouraged for us to play association football, I suppose. Um, so um, you know, that would have been difficult for me, I would say, you know, to go from playing football on the streets in North London to going back to the West of Ireland where there was no streets, there was fields everywhere. And mm. still, I wasn't encouraged to play football. That for me was a bit weird. Uh, so I became quite um, a big promoter of association football, even when it may not have been the most popular thing in the world to do. Uh, and we set up Capmore Celtic, I think it was 12 when we set up the football club in the village. And that was set up by a lot of the young people to organise a team to play against other teams in the villages. You have to remember, and this is why this time is so special for the country. At that time, Jack Charlton had brought the Irish team to a Euros in 1988 and the World Cup in 1990. That was really significant in the history of the country because it changed the perception of football. It's hard to remember that back before 1988, football was in the West of Ireland was not seen as a mainstream sport, really. It was Absolutely. Kind of, you know, and that was difficult because it's even hard to imagine what that was like even now. But I remember it quite well. Um, and it, it it stuck with me. So when Jack Charlton came along, got us to Euros and then a World Cup final, it just changed the mood, the landscape, everything. You know, hundreds and hundreds of clubs were formed, maybe not overnight, but over two nights, maybe, uh, very quickly across the country. Um, and that's why you think that the Celtic Tiger started around that time, 1988, 1989 which people say that that was part of a new, confident, successful country emerging from the ashes of the past. Um, it's different here, but I definitely think the FAW um, now represent a much more confident, successful country to the world. Yeah. So back then, when we, when we were getting to yours in World Cup, that really, I suppose, copper fastened my love of football, and not just what it could, the enjoyment of playing it, but what it could do. So I didn't realise at the time I'd go into you know, using football to create better lives and that kind of stuff, which we do now. Um, but at the time, that was kind of, it was kind of percolating, I guess. I was kind of learning what football could do for a country without really writing it, writing it down, I guess. So anyway, I wanted to be a footballer then. I wanted to play for at a high level. Um, and I got to be signed by Sam Allardyce, actually, who was the manager of Limerick, would you believe? Um, his first job when he finished playing was at Limerick, my local city. So I joined them. and. Um, then I was there for a season or two, and the bigger club, which was Cork City, had started to get into Europe. They played against the likes of Bayern Munich and Galatasaray. Yeah. They had a very good goalkeeper in Phil Harrington. And just yeah. somehow the, the cycle of life works. Um, I used to go to, to Limerick to watch him warm up Phil Harrington. He was a smaller than me, but he was a brilliant Welsh goalkeeper, really top class in, in Ireland, had a big reputation. He was from uh, Carnarfon, but he played with Cumbran, funny enough. Really? Um, he'd, wow. he'd from Carnarfon. Uh, well, no, he'd been away in England, actually. He'd been to Sheffield Wednesday, I think, shattered his ankle, came back and um, got recovered. But he ended up in Cork for some reason. I don't know exactly how, but he ended up over in Cork and he built up this reputation. His the nickname was Biscuits. And he was a, just a brilliant goalkeeper. Anyway, I used to watch him. I used to watch him. I remember in 1989, watching the FAI Cup final and watching Biscuits playing for Cork against Derry uh, in Dalymont Park. Um, Dave Barry was playing for that in that Dave, team? Dave Barry was playing. So I didn't know any of these people. I'd watched it on television. Now, that was 1989. By 1998, I was the Cork City goalkeeper playing in the same stadium in that final with Phil Harrington was my goalkeeping coach and Dave Barry was the manager. So it was quite funny to go on that journey of watching these stars to me uh, on television. And thankfully, I had something that I could play that I ended up playing for Cork City. Um, in, we won the FAI Cup final in 1998. Um, and then we went on to play in Europe every year, which was great, in the World Cup Winners' Cup and the what would be the Europa League now, which was fantastic. And then um, I suppose the game changed and it became more professional. And what I discovered then, and this is probably the crux of the story, is I was a really big reader. So even now when I talk to you beside the laptop here, there's a ton of books here beside me. Um, I'm always reading. And I was reading a lot of business books, a lot of marketing books, communication books, uh, while being a footballer. So we'd get on the bus and I'd read all the time. And I used to get a slagging for it on the bus because I was just not interested in watching rubbish on films and that kind of stuff. I was interested in studying. So I read a lot about business, set up my own business when I was 21 in my kitchen, which went on to become quite a big company. Um, and I was just interested in how business worked. So 
played away and I got to play for Shamrock. I transferred from Cork to Shamrock Rovers, which is probably the biggest club now uh, in Ireland. And then I came back to Limerick, uh, my home city, where a friend of mine had taken over as manager. Really enjoyed my playing, but I was starting to kind of realise that I, 27, 28, I wasn't, I wasn't going to make a career out of it at that stage. And I didn't really want to. I was more interested in the administration. So my career ended. We played Leeds United's reserve team in Limerick. I organised the match, got them to come over, um, played the first half. I think it was nil nil at half time. But the manager, who was my friend, said to me, you're not really interested in this game, are you? You're more interested in the crowd and how the advertising looks. And I said, it's not actually that. It's just that I forgot that the money at half time that we took in has to go to the bank really quickly. If it doesn't, something could happen here. I was trying to organise a secure car van to come and collect the money off the gate to get it down to the bank so we could pay the wages of the players. So I'd now gone from being the goalkeeper to organising the wages of the players, you know. So I was more interested in the business of the club, I suppose, what I'm trying to say. And I was 28, maybe, um, at that stage. And then the FAI put out an advert of the longest job title in the world, which was National Coordinator of the Club Promotions Officer Programme. Uh, yeah. Uh, and I applied for that. It was just in the newspaper. And I went up to Merrion Square, where they used to be, and I walked yeah. into the boardroom there, and I gave a presentation. It was supposed to be for 20 minutes in the future of Irish football. I think I talked for an hour. And at the end of it, I think I just bored them into submission, I'd say, because they, they gave me the indication that I was going there. So that was good. Um, and I started there. And I must say, the day I walked in, um, I knew I was home, as in the marriage between football and business for me was like what they tell you or they should tell you in career guidance is if you can find someone pay, to pay you to do something you absolutely love doing, then you never work. I've never worked um, yeah. because everything I do is pure pleasure, to be honest, which I know you have difficult moments you to make decisions, blah, blah, blah. But it's not work. I don't call this work. I call this my hobby. Um, so... I went to the FBI and I hobbied really hard. I didn't work hard. I hobbied really hard. I worked really hard and I studied a lot and I got better and stronger in all these different areas. And then UEFA started asking me to present at different events. And then um, I was asked to go and help Kazakhstan and Israel and different countries with their strategies. And I noticed that UEFA were asking me to do a lot of things within three or four years. Um, so then I went to present at something and then someone said to me, the marketing director said, can you write a paper on the future of European football. So I'd been at the FBI four or five years. The mood was starting to change there at that stage. They had had issues with this uh, construction of the Aviva Stadium uh, in Dublin in terms of funding that. There was an economic collapse and how it was managed uh, is for a different day's podcast, I'd say. Uh, yeah, but I had, decided, I, I had decided I was leaving um, at that stage. There was no budget for marketing, nothing. So I decided I was leaving. Um, Hi guys, a quick break from our episode just to let you know that we have released our mortgage course for free for a limited period of time. There is so much false information out there at the moment that is creating panic, stress and worry for everyone. We all know how difficult it is when you're trying to get your first mortgage or that new deal. Click on the link in the description below and get started and use our years of experience to help you through these troubled times. Thankfully, as I was jumping off one train, UEFA read my paper on the future of European football, asked me to come over and meet them at UEFA in Switzerland, and basically said, when can you start to implement this thing? So that was, that was it. That was as simple as it was. There was no interview. It was literally, when can you start? So they'd seen me. They'd seen me kind of working and the way I thought and that about the game and that, so they were quite happy. So I started then, and um, again, when I got to have a day one, I knew straight away this is going to be my home for a long time. So it was my home, and I was promoted many times, thankfully, at UEFA um, to be the head of strategy and all strategic development, which was all of our relationship with the 55 countries. And that was lovely because you could work with Germany one day on their participation, France the next day on their commercial plan, Sweden the next day on their relationship with governments, digital transformation in Turkey, you name it. And it wasn't me doing it, thank you. You'd be glad to know. It was um, it was much more talented people than me who I could bring in, who was the best, you know, the best of what they did. So I was like the generalist who would pull it together and say, okay, diagnose the problem, like a consultant, and then work with Turkey on their strategy in this area, whatever it was, building stadiums, whatever it was. And I suppose what I got there was to learn from the very best that we could employ in whatever field. Well, we were taking people from Apple and from the best sports in the world and Microsoft's and digital transformations. You name it, we could, you know, because we had good resources. So I spent 10 years driving that forward. Somewhere in, towards the end of that, 
the FAI, who I'd mentioned, had got into trouble with the stadium, really had capitulated at that stage. And I found that difficult to watch because I'm from there. I hadn't been there for a good few years or hadn't really um, followed it fully, but I realized they were in real trouble. So I got the um, curly finger to say, would you have an interest in going back to Ireland to help them? And I said, well, how bad is it? And I was told, it's really bad. This is batting down the hatches. This is try and keep the door open stuff. Yeah. So we were having our first child at the time um, in Switzerland. My wife is Estonian. So we had to make the difficult decision. It was a six month mission. That's what we'd all agreed to keep the thing alive, just to make sure it didn't die. Um, and that was difficult. It was 215 staff, couldn't pay the salaries the first month I was there. Wow. Um, had a cyber attack. We had the women's manager walking out the door on the first day I was there. Uh, but thankfully, in amongst all that mayhem, my wife went back to Estonia where our support network was and had our son um, there. I went back to Dublin and worked, I don't know, 16, 17 hour days just to keep the doors open and to bring confidence back to the organization and to get it on a place where it could be saved. I mean, the debt was absolutely enormous. And thankfully, we did some deals that took it back out of verging on, on, on being in real, real trouble, I suppose. Wow. Um, so that was a big mission, I have to say. So then I re, so I had to resign from UEFA and then resign for them because I was doing deals at the FEI that would have meant I had to leave. So I resigned for UEFA immediately at the end of six months, which was what we had agreed. Went back to UEFA was in the same job. I was really happy uh, to back over my team, working along. New son comes along. Um, I have to mention, by the way, that while I was in Ireland, one of my uh, more positive things in dealing, as part from dealing with debt uh, and all the wrangles that were going on was the hiring of Vera Powell who went on to yeah. um, there's an interesting story there when my son was born in Estonia I got there just in time for him to be born and as my son is being born I got a phone call to go and meet someone who was interested in being our manager in Frankfurt the next day and I went and signed up for Vera Powell went straight back to see my son then so <laughs> the, the wife was still out of it so she didn't notice I was gone for a few hours but I went from <laughs> Helen to Frankfurt to sign Vera and I'm glad to see she's gone on to get the Irish team to the World Cup finals as well next summer in Australia and New Zealand. So that was a very good, um, very nice uh, thing to see see them qualify. Anyway, go back to you, if I'm working away. And I'm enjoying it. But I kind of enjoyed the adrenaline and the buzz of running the organisation, even though it was yeah. really testy and really difficult. I really enjoyed it. Every moment of the six months that I was in Ireland, every second of it, I enjoyed. I really yeah. felt... I like being the CEO. I like being in charge of this organization. And I like putting my thoughts and my views and my ability out there and working with lots of people that are much more talented than I am to get big results and to drive things forward. As I really felt, then out of the blue, um, the job here in company came up, the job to become the CEO of the Football Association of Wales popped up. And that was really interesting. And I did, you know, what, I suppose it was surprising at the time because I had a, a job in UEFA that was really at the centre of European football. It was a really sexy job. Um, and I suppose I was even trying to explain this to my wife. Look, we're leaving Geneva, our lovely house beside the lake, to move to Cardiff. <laughs> now, Cardiff, we've grown to love. And it's a beautiful yeah. city. And I wouldn't leave here now for anywhere. But when I first said it to her, that wasn't the reaction <laughs> that she had. Said, well, what? What? Um, so I did everything. I was very lucky because Laura McAllister, I got to know, uh, she's a professor in Cardiff University. She'd run for yeah. the FIFA X, so I got her to know her for that. She was talking to me at the time about, yeah, maybe come to Wales, run the FAW, or I was talking to her about it. And she sent me a picture of Poncana um, near Cathedral Road. And I, I showed my wife that. I said, that's what it's like. She went, oh, that looks okay. I think I showed That was picture. on a sunny day, I presume. And it was a beautiful yeah. sunny yeah. day. I showed her a picture and said, oh, that looks nice. So I said, yeah, we're going there. So she was kind of okay. Um, and thankfully, when she came here, it was beautiful sunshine, actually, when we arrived here. So that all worked out fine. Um, but I did my due diligence. So I really looked at what was working well here. But I also noticed a huge amount of deficiencies that needed to be sorted out. Yeah. And I felt that I had the ability and I had the um, gravitas, I guess, to deliver them. Um, and there were big ones. I mean, there was a new strategy needed to be developed. There was a huge amount of governance reform that needed to be developed to get us to a place where we could make, mm -hmm. to become an agile, very successful organization. Um, and I must say, a year and two months maybe into the job, I could not be happier that we're on the right track. I'm really in a feel that we're in a very good place financially. 
more importantly, many of that um, on the pitch were producing our players, were producing results in participation, were growing the game, particularly the girls' game, were building every day, were building new products every day. That I think when I hand over the baton in a few years' time to the person who replaces me, I think that we'll be in a much, much better place and we'll be a real player in world football. Yeah, no. Um, because we we've chatted quite a, a bit, I'm gonna I, I was gonna ask one or two questions, but you you chatted on it there that your journey and where you are. One thing, and I don't know, um, I picked up on there the the last few weeks reading bits and pieces about the whole organisation. That is, um, we're massive here into um, education because we work in in the day job of finance. We have this concept or idea that people have been educated incorrectly. They don't understand money. They don't have a re- the correct relationship with money. They don't understand how they have to align their happiness with what they spend. And it's a full educational thing. So as much as we do all the normal um, day-to-day stuff, there's a, there's quite a lot on YouTube channels, webinars and all that. Um, I am coming on to the question because it is, I think it's relevant. One player, one club. Yeah. Okay. If, if kids are going down that route, if they go to, instead of, I'm going to say, let's say you mentioned it there, Poncana United or Cardiff City Academy. Is that is that the the way they're looking at? It's it's one or the other. Yeah. So if they go down that route, um, is there going to be, is there uh, within the whole um, framework that you have set up? Because the vast majority of those kids will be potentially, let's say they're in a Cardiff City Academy. They're going to go through a system where, a lot of them are going to be in a uh, sounds horrible word spat out. There's only going to be a sure, select few course. that do make yeah. it. Of course, education for the likes of those guys and girls going forward. Um, is is that something that you guys have looked at, or is it in the the, the structure going forward? Because it is our ideas that the sciences and the geography and all that of the world anymore is kind of not relevant. You need to know how to become an entrepreneur, a CEO yeah. of an organization, yeah. understand money, and all that sort of stuff. Well, a couple of things. They're a little bit unrelated. I mean, the one player, one club is 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 a universal principle, by the way, that you can't play for a number of clubs at the same time. Yeah. Um, and that's one that, you know, it's a FIFA rule. Um, we had been given a derogation longer than anybody else for a number of years to do that. Mm. Um, but for us, I mean, it's up to the choice of the girl or boy if they want to have an elite career, which should be for very few, to be honest. I mean, it's as you know, it's less than 1% become professional yeah. footballers, clearly. Um, so that the problem we had where the, the water was very muddied here was that we've so many academies across the country. We probably only need four or five academies, you know, of the players who will go on to have professional careers um, across the country. So we have too many academies and we're going through an evolution now of recategorizing them at the minute. And let's see how that goes. But I think, you know, to take, if a child wants to be a professional footballer, first of all, they need to have the ability for sure mm-hmm. and then go into these academies. But the vast, vast majority should be playing for Poncana United or whatever the name of their yeah. club is. I mean, to take thousands and thousands and thousands out seems to be a bit too much to me. Um, and I think the technical people would, would certainly agree with that. So that's an evolution that we go on. But in terms of the education for them, it's a strange situation here because... At the moment, the ones who are going to Qatar, the ones who go on to make really serious careers, are gone from the Welsh system in truth very young. You know, I'm talking nine, ten years of age. Yeah. So they signed for Swans or they signed for Cardiff or they signed for Southampton or they signed for Manchester United or wherever they signed for. And they're gone from us um, very young. And that's natural. They're going to go on to become world class athletes. They often get spotted at nine or ten there are situations when the Irish situation would be Seamus Coleman um, who was 20 odd when he signed for Everton I guess uh, you know and has gone on to have a remarkable career and there's others um, who've gone on to, uh, Stephen Ward for example went from Bohemians to Wolves and went on to play in European Championships and all that stuff but by and large in this part of the world um, players are spotted much much younger what I would definitely say is that the professional clubs do that they've got programs that come from the English system where they do all sorts of um uh, training exams is it enough my understanding of, i'm not an expert here i have to say but my understanding is no it's not enough what the english professional clubs are doing for the players is not enough but i see ben davies for example uh, who plays for spurs in the premier league and clearly has made an unbelievably successful career for himself yeah. uh, has just done an economics degree with london business school for example so it's possible to because there's a lot of downtime 
when you're professional football and you may as well occupy your mind with something you're interested in that's good for you future wise and he'd be very switched on into finance for example he, he, mm. he's really focused on that sort of economics and finance and different things but what i would say is as we become more professional here in Cymru we're going to we're doing a review of the Cymru Premier Division now one of the headings that that is under that is education for the players and dual careers you know that you do have like we had back in the League of Ireland which was to play for Cork City but um, also to have a business career as well which really worked fine for me I was really happy with that and it felt better for my lifestyle I wouldn't like to be a professional footballer really I don't think my mind would have taken that well to it to be honest with you I think I liked being active and doing things that were yeah. productive during the day rather than just sleeping all the time and drinking lots of water uh, and just training for a couple of hours a day. I didn't really like that, to be honest, which I didn't feel suited to that. So what I would say is that under the review of the Comedy Premier Division um, and also what we do in the girls game, which is explosive at the moment, is making sure that they have the correct education on their mm-hmm. finances, uh, but also on the, you know, that they have got careers you know, degrees or masters, whatever it is, so they can go and have a good career and be supported by Welsh football too. That absolutely, 100% agree with you. Did, did I read, no correctly that you guys had spent more on the women's game for a, lo- a smaller uh, group than the um, English FA? Or did I read that? Well, all of Europe. Um, so oh. what UEFA do is under a program I used to run, which is they look at all of the um, spends. So they take, you know, the, the expenditure and they look at how we spend our money. And they look at our revenues, you know, how how we turn our revenues into output, I suppose. You know, how much you spend on your national teams, how much you spend on your domestic championship, what you spend on grassroots, what you spend on administration. So if you took the percentage of our revenues that we spent on the women's game, it's yeah. more than anybody else in Europe. Now, you have to remember that our turnover could be 25 million. Um, the English FAs could be 400 million. So yeah. they might, in absolute terms, spend, I don't know, 20 million, we might spend 5 million or something like that. But in absolute terms, it yeah. means that our expenditure as a percentage of turnover is higher than anybody else in Europe. And, you know, I mean, what I found is that every pound we put into the women's game is a pound well spent mm-hmm. because the results that we get from them, it's like a home run, the whole thing, to be honest with you. Um, it's like everything we do with women's football works really, really well. Um, um, so... Um, you know, we're really um, we're really happy with what we're doing. But we have to do more with the women's game. There's yeah. a lot of people around us who um, and agree with us that we need to keep improving. We can't sit in our laurels and say, "Oh, it's great that we are um, spending more than anybody else in European football as a percentage turnover." That sounds great as a line, but we need a lot more people working women's football to cater for the sheer demand. And uh, as I say, whatever we invest in women's football, it comes back in you know in spades for us because um, it's always really successful if we hire more people in marketing, communication, more people in coaching. We've just hired Gemma Lewis from New Zealand. Actually, she's a, a Welsh, um, very good coach who's been in New Zealand with the Ferns in New Zealand, working with them. She okay. just moved, moved back here to lead on our women's uh, football development and getting our elite players through. So we're hiring plenty of people in the women's game, but it's never enough because... Yeah. Um, it's just a home run, the whole thing for us. But it's not, that's no different to us talking to people about, you know, their money and they say, how much should I save or invest on a monthly basis? The hardest thing is to start and make sure that you're directionally correct because that's the, the, the most difficult part. When, when you have the momentum, yeah, you can increase yeah. contributions or staff, whatever. That, that, that's all, you know, review, adapt, pivot and change. But Well, it's funny it's, because we're, like finances on the top of our mind at the moment, we're in a very good position at the FAW. We've got a good balance sheet we're healthy, we've got investments and all that kind of stuff that we should have. But we've got three big buckets ahead of us. One is going to be the organizational development. So to expand the staff to be a world-class organization costs money. To um, the Comedy Premier Division um, is going under review at the moment. That's going to take uh, funding. So yeah. our, our professional game, which isn't professional yet, but we've only got TNS who's a professional side at the moment. We want that to be more professionalized on and off the pitch. So that's going to cost money. And the third one is the grassroots side of the game. We've already put four million pounds that we made from the World Cup into the grassroots facilities. So any money we make from qualifying for the World Cup, we've put into yeah. any excess we've put into the newly formed Comedy Football Foundation, which is out now for clubs to apply for to build pitches and dress rooms and different things. And then the grassroots structure. So we're out now every night at the moment of fields talking, consulting about what the grassroots structure should look like. How many people do we need to bring in to help all of our 950 clubs to reach their full potential and to help them with their strategies and their facilities and all that stuff. 
there's going to be a big bill for the FAW probably at the end of that as well. So we're just getting our long-term financial pl planning in place. We've got an outline plan to 2028, um, but that needs to be adjusted based on what strategies we have. We have to invest in our sustainability strategy, which we launched this week. We have to invest in our um, equality, diversity, inclusion, um, our digital transformation. But the three, they're all enablers. The three big focus areas are, um, are the organization becoming world-class, uh, the Cymru Premier Division and the grassroots game. Then you've got the business as usual, like high performance, making sure we've got the services for players like strength and conditioning, nutrition, cryotherapy, all the modern psychology, the things the modern high performing athletes need that costs. And we have to keep, so the core business keeps growing all the time. Yeah. But we've got these three big investments, as I say, in the organization, the professional game and the grassroots. But you, you can see it, and I know it's a bad analogy of using a sausage machine, but you can't just wait for the, the sausages to come out at the end, as in a World Cup, and say, look how beautiful these are. You have no. that At some stage, if you don't no. continue to, to put the meat in at the other end, Definitely. it's not going to work. And the fact that you guys have, um, have a, a looked at all of that and started going back to the grassroots, and yeah, it might be that it's a... It's 12 to 16 years before you see some Definitely. boy or girl that's going to be at the next mm -hmm. World Cup. But even the things that you're doing in terms of the seven to 11 year olds and the schools and giving them packs for the World Cup and yeah. making making the World Cup about that seven, eight year old. Fine. It's going to cost money at the moment, but it's a bit like us doing something. You look at the long term. That's an investing because you, you touched earlier about Italia 90. And, you know, I think we're almost of the same age. I, I Euro 88 was, yeah, I get it. But Italia 90, it was just boom. And from something like that, I presume, back in Ireland, we got Shea Given, Damien Duff, um, you know, Robbie Keane, oh, yeah. which were, yes. you know, 12 years later in uh, South Korea and Japan. But yeah. that, that's where you can see you guys going, that the grassroots, the the, the Cymru Premier, where... You know, you're you're having to put money in there now, knowing that it's not going to be an immediate success. It is going to be the future, and you have to be uh, be willing to play the long game for that. Exactly. I mean, when I talk about sustainability strategy, a lot of it's not about the climate, which is important, or you know, the environment, which is absolutely crucial. But sustainability of football itself. Um, so there's decisions we're making that you definitely won't see the results while I'm here, um, but it'll be my successor who would actually get the benefits of it. It would be easy to put our investment into short-term wins, and yes. that would make the current administration look better because you get short-term results. But that's not sustainable investing. So we're very confident that um, the investments we're making in the grassroots now will bear huge fruits. And also we're also aware of the consequences of not doing that, that you end up with short-term success and then it falls off a cliff later on, and that's not where we can be. So we're very happy to invest anything we're making from the success of the current side um, into the grassroots of the future. We've discussed that with the current squad, the men's squad that's going to the World Cup, and they're really comfortable with that. So it's just getting the balance right, and we have to keep investing in the high performance as well. And if we drop our standards in terms of uh, the quality of travel or um, psychology or nutrition or whatever it is, the big things that uh, the top players need now are talent ID, for example. We've got a very sophisticated talent ID system that goes across the UK every weekend looking for new players for Wales. You know, that's just something we do. Um, and if we stop doing that and invest in all grassroots only and not stick on high performance stuff, we there's a cost there too. So it's really about balancing your finances, as you guys would know well, to get the very most return uh, for your books. It's probably, there's times I wish we were a little bit more focused because it feels like we're trying to do everything. But yeah. it's just deciding that what weighting do you put alongside the area, whether it's the women and girls game, grassroots game, uh, the Comrie Premier or the national teams or whatever it is, the facilities, grassroots facilities, you just put a waiting beside it, prioritise it. And then you, if you want to see what our priorities are, follow the money. Do, do you think, maybe a bit controversial, it, between, I suppose, what was it when did they, you guys win the first Grand Slam, 2005, was it? And kind of 05 to maybe 2016, 2017, Welsh rugby seemed to be on a high. And, you know, if 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 Wales had qualified for a World Cup in between then, you were almost competing for maybe the pound or the supporter, where have you hit it? It sounds wrong at the most appropriate time because there seems to be just a little dip in Welsh rugby now 
um, whereas you you have qualified. So naturally, like all humans, everyone goes where the success is. So potentially you've got more more pounds and supporters because they're maybe maybe those that weren't a Welsh football supporter are now jumping on the bandwagon at the appropriate time because they're disillusioned or unhappy with Wales not winning as much as they did in, in the last decade and a half. I tell you, it's been, I spent very little time looking at what other sports are doing and what they what they're doing. I hear bits and pieces, but I'm so focused on what we're doing and just being successful every day, to be honest, and trying to create a sustainable success. That I don't have time to look at rugby or whatever else is out there. You know, we were aware of figures and participation numbers and things like that, but the correlation I haven't studied, I have to be honest. Um, I know that football is doing really well. I know that rugby is a massive sport here as well. And like what you really want to see is rugby doing brilliantly and football doing brilliantly, because I think if they do particularly well, um, and I'll add to the likes of field hockey, which is big here, and netball as well, of course, yeah. um, uh, for girls, doing well, um, then we're doing better as a country. So we could not be more supportive of um, of everyone doing well. And I know I was at the rugby on Saturday at the All Blacks game, which was, you know, it's really nice to see top athletes at the top of their game. Um, but it was very, I had a lovely reception from the WRU, you know, um, they made a lovely speech at the start, the, the president, and he was very kind about Cymru's participation in the World Cup final. It was really well received by me, I have to say, and by the FAW, that they, they're just so generous in their, um, in their, um, yeah, in their um, appreciation of what we've achieved over the last few years. And I really welcome that from the WRU. So, look, we get on very well. Like we're in different places. We're in different stages of development. There's a thing in business called the S-curve. Yeah. Um, and I, I suppose we're in different places on the S-curve um, at the moment. Uh, but that changes. I have to say that, I mean, there is um, three and a half million CEOs of the WRU, as far as I can see it here in the country. Everyone seems to have a very strong view on how Welsh rugby should be run. I could go That's to... the goldfish bowl of Wales, yeah. It, it really is. Uh, I can go down to the local shop uh, to buy the newspaper and the, the news agent will tell me how Welsh rugby should be organised, uh, which is quite interesting. And football, I don't get that as much. It's they, don't, they don't care how you organise football as long as you yeah, win, as win as this trophy. Winning. Yeah, as long as you're winning, as long as it suits the, the club you're talking to. Ever. So it's quite interesting. I think that's an interesting phenomenon that you know rugby is burned into the hearts of, of a yeah. lot of people here. They're really oh, yeah. interested in how it's organised. We've kind of come at a different angle. It's not a better angle. It's not a worse angle. I don't think. It's just a different. It's a more. It's a more um, because we're coming a bit later, I suppose, to becoming very much part of the national discussion with the national team. It's just different. I, 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 again, I say it's not better. It's worse or worse or like that. But we've got a very very clear belief system. We've got a very clear roadmap. A very clear strategy. We know exactly what we're doing. Um, all the team around me, the management team, the board, the council, we're all on the same page. And that, for me, is the bedrock to success, that we're all clear in what we're doing. Yeah, I, I think that was something, like, we, we spoke a bit off air about it, but, you know, the, the big thing, I think, that has been big for you is bringing that structure in place, isn't it? And Definitely. and yeah. and even, like, I I think it's getting that foundation right, because if you don't get the foundation right, it's like building a house, isn't it? It's going to come tumbling down. And uh, and I know a big thing that you you talked about was getting, getting football in Wales profitable. Yes. Yeah, definitely. I believe that we are like we've just launched our financial results for the last year. We create a good operating profit from what should have been a considerable operating loss because we had invested in a lot of things, but we really drove our revenues. We really focused on our cost base and we created a, a decent profit for the year, which was really a big turnaround from where what the budget was when I certainly arrived. But I think critically, um, not long after I joined, we did a full governance review. I presented that governance review to the council and that was a critical moment um, because that was um, agreed called sustainable association of the future for the future and that was 18 governance changes basically which were really significant and they have been the bedrock of our success so signing up to significant governance evolution um, getting everyone on the same page and it doesn't matter what we're talking about and that could be about football that could be about selling toothpaste you know, if you get the board, the council and all of the different st stakeholders aligned behind the plan that you've all agreed on, it's actually not that hard to be really honest yeah. in doing it. You just need to really believe in what you're doing, have huge conviction and bring people with you and show that you're listening to people. And it's a two way street. But that once the decision is made, you have to put your foot down and say, this is the direction I'm 
people have to feed from you that conviction of if we go down this route, we're going to be successful. Yeah, I, I, and I think that that can be, like you say, transferred across everything. Like you mentioned the analogy of buying, you know, selling toothpaste or whatever. Yeah, but I think that's in every business, every organization. Yeah. If if you can get everyone onto the same plan, the same directional point as you, it, it makes a huge difference. Because if you've got people pulling in different directions, you've got problems then. It's a real problem. Um, and like Welsh football would have had that, I'm sure, over the years. But thankfully, we're a very happy family now. Um, and we're very lucky. I and mean, we've got a president. Uh, who comes has been with the federation for many many years has grown up through the federation but he's a pillar of strength for me because i can't do it on my own i need a president who's very supportive because he's the chair of the council we need a strong independent chairperson that we have in steve dalton the md of sony uk manufacturing he's our independent chair and that's a really important outlet for me to go to he's used to dealing with very big businesses um in what he's got now um, and he's a very useful ally for me. And we've got independent directors like Carol Bell um, and Tim Naylor, who's from British Horse Racing. Carol Bell is a very experienced independent non-executive director. I spend a lot of time talking to them about things. And then you've got the football membership, which is crucial on the board, because you need to get the vibe of what are the things that we can implement yeah. or when yeah. is it too soon? Which are the ones that will cause a big problem? Which are the ones that would um, would sail through? And it's the football members, the board, give me the football um, knowledge and bring the board forward that way and it's the independent directors who are used to dealing with huge businesses mm. give us the business um, thing and we've got a very strong finance audit risk committee which is the former first minister Carwin Jones is on for example uh, that really robustly tests any hypothesis or proposals I put forward for investment into the game so you know we have the right checks and balances in place um, to make sure the organisation is run prudently but we're always increasing our risk appetite which is crucial we need to have more risk appetite, which sounds funny, but as long as the governance, uh, as long as the governance is strong enough to ensure that we may remain prudent, but capitalizing on opportunities while mitigating risks, we'll be absolutely fine and we'll grow, grow, grow over the next few years a lot. You, you could do a session with lots of our clients in here because you're using all the right words that we will be using exactly for most of their financial planning and retirement planning of, you know, prudence and risk mitigation and, and stuff like that. So, uh, you, you know, you, you can you can do a session for us, but you've hit all the things of um, creating a plan, surrounding yourself with, with great people, um, uh, being being aggressive in the, the way you want to go and then almost blocking out the noise and just going exactly. with that. Uh, and we talk we talk a lot um, because it's it's our day job of financial freedom and it's about the, the ability to do what you want when you want while at the same time removing the fear of ever running out of money. And well, there's, there's one thing that I have to add in there that I've left out that I think is feeding to what you say, which is creating a culture of a of expression that allows people to make mistakes. By the way, yeah. and mistakes that are not going to pull you down, but they're mistakes nonetheless. And we've got some mistakes happen every day. And I always tell the gang, tell me if there's something has gone wrong as quickly as you can. And the faster someone tells me that something's gone wrong, the quicker I say to them, thank you. Because it means that we don't get caught flat footed by not knowing something and we can rectify the mistake much quicker. That's really important to our culture that people yeah. are allowed, you know, it's, it's almost encouraged, make mistakes quickly and let's move on. But is it a mistake? No, let's, you're, you, if you're directionally correct, there are going to be times when the when the plane goes off course, and and all you're doing is is um you know readjusting an alignment. Yeah. It's not correcting a mistake because a mistake can be you know a millimeter or a thousand miles. It just because you're off course by a certain um uh, percentage at the outset, when you grab that at the moment and you realize it's not the right night right thing to do or the right way to go. It's just a, a redirection. It's not. It's not that difficult. Directionally, to... we're, we're bang on. Direction. I feel so confident and comfortable. With the direction that we're in. Uh, our strategy is publicly available. By the way, you can see at any stage yeah. um, how we're doing against all of our seventy or eighty commitments that we've made. I mean, one of the commitments was to qualify for the World Cup finals in the men's. We've done that. So a tick. Uh, now we have to qualify for the women's Euro in twenty five. Is the next uh, thing, and the men's Euros in twenty four. We'd like to qualify for a lot of underage tournaments as well so like, we've an awful lot in front of us um, but we feel that we're in a good direction it's been a huge um, pleasure to talk to you um, today so I hope yeah. that was been useful for you yeah no it's been, it's been really good um, it's been anytime, anytime you want really to appreciate it and, and uh, good luck good luck with everything
Thank you so much, enjoy, guys. Enjoy the next few weeks. Thanks, guys. Good luck.